Well, projects are a backdrop for channeling the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the problem and you start to realize there are no specific problems, there's no environmental problems, relationship problems, health issues, there's just no specific problems, but cracked or distorted perception is the problem. What do they say in the Bible? You, you, you look through a darkened glass, it says in Corinthians. That's a problem, looking through a darkened glass. You can't really see. None of us can see when we're looking through a darkened glass. So if, if distorted or fragmented perception is the problem, then what is it that will stabilize that distorted perception, that will clear away that darkened glass? Jesus says, only a, a single purpose can unify perception. Only a single purpose can unify perception. So we have this purpose in it. You can call it forgiveness. You can call it atonement. You can call it the miracle. You can call it one single intention. You can call it anything you want. But this one single purpose exercised, practiced, used, done through, will unify perception. So when we seem to have projects and tasks, well, let's take a look at that. That would have to be the purpose behind the projects and the tasks, to unify perception. What would be the purpose of doing the dishes? to be done through so perfectly by the Holy Spirit, or building something, or repairing something, or teaching something, or singing, or dancing, or whatever the form was, the, the purpose would have to be forgiveness, the unified perception, to unify all of perception, and to be totally done through until there is no doer, and you are simply a, aware that you are a being. So, for me, that was, that's been my whole life, you know, I seem to have skills and abilities that were developed in an ego context, and then I gave them over to the Holy Spirit. I was shy. I was a loner. I was not a social butterfly in any sense of the word. I, I had a great hesitation around speaking and communication. I was on a job many years ago where they did a job evaluation, and I was so unworthy and uncertain myself that oftentimes when I was talking to my superiors or whatever, my words would drift off into a mumble. I actually mumbled. I would start off with a sentence and I would mumble. And then I would get an evaluation back and it said, David eats his words. Because I was so uncertain, I would mumble. And, and so speaking was not exactly a strength. I never went to Toastmasters, but it was not a strength at all. And neither was public speaking or any of those kind of things. But again, I, I was willing to give everything over to the Holy Spirit to use for this single unified purpose. And that's what the projects are about. And of themselves, it doesn't mean anything. Sometimes I can go to a monastery or convent, and even before I go through the gates, I can feel, feel telepathically whether there's great depth there, or whether there's a lot of people pleasing and busyness all for the sake of rules and regulations and whatever, because I can feel the presence before I actually go into the convent or the monastery, because it's the purpose underneath those doings that means everything. And you know how the ego works. It can get you real busy <laughs> into much ado about nothing where it's almost like you're just doing it because I told you so, because it has to be done, you know, for all the reasons, you know, that, that are given. And then there's this sense of presence where, where there's such a flow, kind of like that movie, You Can't Take It With You, with Grandpa's house, you know, where everybody, one guy's making fireworks in the basement, one lady's writing and using the little kitten, you know, as a paperweight typing, and one's doing ballet and dancing, and one's playing the xylophone. It's a great movie with Jimmy Stewart and Lionel Barrymore, but, but they're all in a state 
of being done through and there's great joy in the house. You could go down the street to a monastery where they're making cheese or, you know, sweeping and doing these things and if it's just ritual, the ego loves ritual for ritual's sake. There's no inspiration behind ritual. Even the Course is just says it's a brief ritual with the with the workbook and he's asking you to springboard off that and henceforth hear only the voice for God. Let the voice for God direct you in all subsequent learning. It's not meant to keep you in ritual, it's meant to free you from ritual so you can be totally spontaneous. How does the advanced teacher of God spend his day? It's a question for Jesus and Jesus says to the advanced teacher of God this question is superfluous. You don't even have a thought in your mind about how you're going to spend the day. You're just into joy of just whooshing through you, you know, and you're not thinking, okay, this, 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 this. And as for, you know, like the beginning of Carrie's question was like, sometimes it gets depressing to think of doing the things you're doing. If you push them out over the timeline. I, I had a day the other day, it was several days ago, where somebody was saying, you know, I can't wait till I'm where David is or I want to be a messenger of peace so I can have easy street and just sit around and sip tea and sit in the hot tub all day and just look at the cloud patterns go by and smile and laugh and and I think that was one of my days where I a typical day like I'd had in that week where I was having like 14 hour days where I would get up and I'd be sucked into my communication function with Skype calls correspondences, going around, meeting people, seeing people, and then, and then like 14 hours later, just kicking back and throwing my shoes off and going, ah. But it wasn't a tired, ah. It was just like, oh yeah. It just was being done through for 14 hours, like a whirling dervish, <laughs> and yet feeling energized by it, not feeling fatigued at all by those 14 hours. More like the nest tea plunge. Ah, back into the water, you know. Because because the whole point's to be done through. It's not it's not to think I need do nothing is talking about the form. Oh, that's a sneaky one, you know, the ego can get you into I need do nothing and then after a while you start to feel bored, lazy, lethargic. You know, and you know that the ego has slipped another Mickey in the drink, you know, and and you didn't even know it. You're like, I'm going to be on easy street today. I'm going to do nothing. And then you're like, no, 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 no. No. where's the joy? Where's the joy? Let's have some joy. You know, because you're trying to do, the ego is trying to do nothing. Miracles are involuntary. You know, it doesn't mean anything to you. If you're not in the joy, if you're not truly, you know, coursed through by the Spirit. So, yeah, so that's, that's what the projects are for. They're only for one thing, and that's for unifying perception. And there's one part in the Course where Jesus says, you can use the body with the Holy Spirit to expand your perception. I love that. Imagine Somebody says to you, sweep the floor. Okay. And then you tell yourself, oh, I'm going to expand my perception. That's the truth. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Not, yeah, I'll get this, sweep some under the rug here, see if they can see that. You know, it's, it's, very, it's very different. The ego is devious, and the Holy Spirit is like, yeah, expand your perception. I remember one time I was in. Denver, Colorado, at a spiritual group called the, with this group called the School of Innocence, and and uh, one of the people in the community, Joshua, was told by somebody there that he had to go out and rake the leaves in the backyard, and he was raking the leaves all right, but not like Ben. Ben's famous time where. He was here at the monastery, and I don't know who told you to go out. Was it Lisa or somebody told you to go rake the leaves? And Ben had long hair like Moses, and he had this big flowing robe on like Moses. 
and somebody here at the monastery had told him to go rake the leaves. There was like a 45 mile an hour wind outside. <laughs> and Ben grabbed that rake, and I swear I was right here in this room, and I was looking right out this window with Lisa. Lisa was right there, and we looked out, and we went, that's inspiring. Because Ben was out there dancing in the wind. He looked like Gene Kelly with this rake, and he was raking, and I mean the leaves were blowing all over the place. And he, he wasn't literally raking the leaves for, to get him in a pile or anything, because he couldn't get his rake on him. But he was like dancing away, and his hair was blowing in the wind. This was back in those, before you had clean shaven, you had the long Moses hair and the big Moses robe, and all the shiny, sparkly things on it. And he was so happy. And Lisa's like, all glory to God. Praise sweet Jesus, you know. And to me, that was just a clear example of the miracle because you said yes to rake those leaves and damn if you could even rake a leaf because it was blowing all over. Now let's get back to my story with Denver. I, I, this was the opposite of that. I remember looking out there and Joshua was pissed. He was pissed. He was angry. And I remember going outside and walking up to him and he's raking the leaves and he's really, he's really angry. Every emotion was anger, anger, anger. And so I said, well, stop for a minute. Let's just talk and everything. And he said to me, it's kind of the same thing along the line of Chris's question about what's the purpose. He said, what does raking leaves have to do with enlightenment? And I said, that's a really good question. Let's put the rake down and let's explore that. What does raking leaves have to do with enlightenment? I said, this is really good. I said, now, how are you feeling now? He said, I am very angry. And I said, well, what do you think's going on? He said, well, the so-and-so told me to rake the leaves. I don't want to rake the leaves. I'm not inspired to rake the leaves. I don't see the value in raking the leaves. I'm angry at this person for telling me and bossing me around. And I'd rather be doing anything else but raking the leaves. I said, okay, from all of that we can deduce that you're upset. And he said, yes. I said, okay, now, what does upset have to do with enlightenment? Let's take it away from what does the raking the leaves have to do with enlightenment. Let's just look at your state of mind. What does upset have to do with enlightenment? And he said, it, it doesn't have anything to do with enlightenment. And I said, so why do you think you're upset then? If you came here, what, what was the purpose? Did you, why did you come to this community? He said, I came here for enlightenment. But I said, but now you're upset. He said, yeah, I'm upset. But you came here for enlightenment, and now you're upset. So you're not in the purpose for which you came. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, why is that? He said, I, I don't know. I said, well, can you see that the purpose is a choice? Did you have a choice of your state of mind, regardless of what you're doing? And he said, yeah, I can see that. I said, well, why are you choosing to be upset? Well, because they told me I had to rake the leaves. I said, so you believe there's somebody outside of you, somebody not you, that told you you have to do something that you don't want to do? He said, yeah, that's it. I said, what does that have to do with enlightenment? I don't, I guess nothing. I said, well, why are you choosing it? I don't know. I said, how did you get here? I said, did somebody twist your arm, come down to Louisiana and like put, twist your arm behind your back and say, you've got to go to Denver to get enlightened? No. I said, did you come here voluntarily? He said, yeah. I said, so you're here voluntarily. Nobody made you come. That's right. So you're here voluntarily. Yeah, that's right. And your purpose of coming is for enlightenment. Yes, that's right. And now you're upset. Yeah. Well, why are you choosing to be upset? Well, they, they told me I had to rake the leaves. <laughs> it's who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know, it's no amount of evidence will convince you of what you do not want. It's the purpose you bring with you 
It's the purpose in mind that you bring to the projects, that you bring to the whatever you're doing. That's everything. That's your decision. It's not that the world happens to you in some kind of accidental, oh, I happen to have a bad day because this happened to me and this and this and this. You know, remember the, the workbook lesson, myself, capital self is ruler of the universe. It is impossible that anything should come to me unbidden my, by myself. Even in this world, it is I who rule my destiny. What happens is what I desire. And what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. Okay, you don't need a whole Course in Miracles. You can just use that one phrase that myself is ruler of the universe. The power of decision, lesson 152. The power of decision is my own. He says, you may believe that this is too all-encompassing to be the truth, Jesus says. The power of decision is my own. But, he says, truth has no exceptions. Indeed, that's exactly the way it is. Everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I've asked. And there are no exceptions. Ever, ever, ever. So, this is where we're zooming in to enlightenment, where we start to take the empowering journey of seeing how powerful our mind is, the power of decisions, and we don't try to let ourselves get snagged into this idea that we're just raking leaves, or just doing the dishes, or just chopping the celery, or whatever, which the ego would have us freeze into. Because why? Because that's littleness. And the ego wants us to be content with littleness and just leave it at that. Just stay guilty and little. And, and a unified purpose lifts us up higher and higher and higher into a state of the celestial glory, you know, to, to a level of mind which we see is all encompassing. So it's never about the project. It's more about the motive. What's the motive? What, what is it for? What's the motive for the project? And for me, that's the best thing in my life is it doesn't matter if I have 50 emails. The number doesn't matter. Uh, I just pray, and if I'm guided to pick out two or three and respond to those, then that's everything. And I've never felt a sense of coercion. I've never felt a sense of duty. It's, it's not fun to feel that you have a duty to serve the Holy Spirit, you know. An obligation. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a day serving the Holy Spirit. I'm obligated uh, to the Holy Spirit today. You know, where's the fun in that? I, I would always say, what the Holy Spirit wants for me is for me to be happy. To me, for me to be inspired, for me to experience myself as I truly am, and not to hold on to this idea of what David wants, what David wants, what does, David doesn't want. You know, that's going to get me nowhere. Most of the task that I did at the very beginning, um, even ones that, that the Holy Spirit would, would ask me to do, talk to somebody or call somebody and do this and this, I had trepidation and fear and doubt at the beginning because it was so out of pattern for the way I was living my life. And yet I still followed and I felt burst of joy after I got off the phone, after I visited somebody in the hospital, made a, paid a visit to their house. I was just swelling with joy because I listened and followed, even when the ego was saying, don't do it, don't do it, stop. You're going to lose your autonomy, you're going to lose your individuality if you keep following in that little voice. I just kept at it. No, I, li I tell the ego, I like that joy. I like that feeling of joy. I want more of that feeling of joy. And so I, I lost myself in that um, Joy. I lost my ego, you could say, not my true self, but in that experience.